Thank you. Today it's AI for good, but there's also a incentive, a commercial incentive, in the, a material incentive in that always makes makes the conversation more interesting. Uh, I'll, uh, and this talk will be very different than the talk you heard before. This will be down to earth, very plain, no big picture here. Although I'm, I'm familiar with the big picture, uh, a little bit about myself and my interest. I'm a data scientist and a scientist, uh, biologist by training. And uh, in the last uh, year or so after doing an MBA, I'm, do I'm doing more and more projects for company where I'm working on, on real practical problems, uh, solving f problems in the drug industry and uh, lately also in agriculture. And I was a, a fortunate enough to solve uh, actually two other challenges for Syngenta uh, in, uh, in other topics, process improvements. So there was no big data involved, but it was just looking at a, a certain uh, procedures and how to improve them. Also, I have a, f a family background that draw me, I think, to this challenge. My uh, grandfather was a farmer and actually was a graduate of Wisconsin University in agriculture. My mother is a plant geneticist and worked on uh, Gene, on plant genes in the Weizmann Institute. So I have a sort of family interest in, in plant sciences as well, although eventually I chose to uh, focus my academic career in, uh, in mammalians and in healthcare. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I can f relate to the comments about how plants are complicated, humans are complicated, every, everything is complicated in biology. Uh, and for this challenge, I recruited a recent graduate from the University of Toronto, Vanessa, and she's uh, s developing a career in, uh, in uh, plant sciences and she's working on adaptation of plants uh, to uh, high temperatures and drought. And uh, the challenge as, you, as uh, we heard is uh, developing a, a model for uh, identifying high yields uh, in soy, a variants that have high yields. The, and I, again, I have to, to again thanks Syngenta and AI for good for providing uh, the, the data for this challenge. It was clear that the data is very nicely laid out. Uh, the, the, we didn't have to waste any time on going over the data and fixing all kind of bugs in the data. The data was uh, clearly uh, a lot of work went into main maintaining the data and providing uh, state-of-the-art data. <coughs> What we, uh, the practice of uh, selecting uh, yields is a uh, is three annual, three seasons. They are after the crosses are done. Uh, over three years, they are monitored successively, and uh, the high yields st uh, variants are selected. And then in the fourth stage, there is more a field uh, stage where more uh, locations are being tested for these yields. And we had access to all of the data in the years marked in uh, white. And the, year, the, and the challenge was also very crystal clear. What, can you predict which uh, yield, which variants will be high yields or will continue to the commercial uh, uh, avenue after the three years, provided the three years uh, prior to that? So it's very clear. Uh, it's, it helps the solver if the, the question is the research question is very clear. We didn't use a, a crystal ball to, uh, to uh, make the prediction. We had, and I'll describe exactly what we did uh, in terms of the modeling, but the solution also that we provided was crystal clear. We said these are the 15 uh, on, the, on the table on your right. You can see the, 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 the variants that we selected as elite and, no, and the, the yields that they are going to, to uh, that we predict. And also we compare them to the, uh, to the commercial availabilities to ensure that we, have, that we boost the yield. So we have uh, more than uh, two bushels per acre uh, yields. That, uh, and again, relating to the big picture, yeah, we, we can say that we can uh, quite easily uh, boost uh, returns or boost yields by about 5%, which in the big picture will help uh, feeding the, the world. And uh, we were asked about uh, uh, estimated of type one error. And in this case, I'm, I'm showing on the table on the left, I'm showing what is, can we apply the same algorithm in the class of 2013? And we notice there, there are quite a bit of uh, um, lines that were selected by Syngenta, but we uh, say that uh, although Syngenta has selected them as elite, we, our model predicts that they are not elite. So there is a deficiency in the way, in the process as it is uh, performed right now uh, by, by seed companies, and there are opportunities to uh, make it better by utilizing uh, the more uh, state-of-the-art algorithm similar to the algorithms that uh, we use. 
and of course the algorithm is based on the data and we, some of the data is the phenotypic data that we received uh, from Syngenta. The environment plays, uh, as we heard, a crucial role and we relied on the soil data provided by Syngenta. So there was weather data provided but we eventually decided not to use the data uh, in, the uh, in the weather category. Of course, the, one of the reasons we, we actually uh, uh, were attracted to this challenge because both me and Vanessa have a, a background in genetics. We thought we can do something interesting with the SNP data, and I'll show you eventually why we decided not to use the SNP data or the genetic data in this challenge. And, and finally, we augmented the, the data because it was a freedom to add as much data as you want, and we found a very convenient uh, source of data. Not surprisingly, NASA, the big eye in the sky, keeps uh, a, a lot of uh, in interesting data related to plants, so uh, NDVI, which I'll talk about later, and, uh, and, uh, mod and through the MODIS program. And uh, just on the maturity group, because that was new to me, that uh, soy is, is bred in a, in a way that uh, adapts the, the, the flowering time and, this, and the, pod, the development time to the uh, very strict uh, geographical uh, boundaries, uh, bands. So you can get, uh, so the soy plants are in, in uh, agriculture can uh, maximize the yield or the growth based on the, the environment that they are in. And this is one of the important uh, decisions for the farmers, so we couldn't ignore it also in our models. And, and a quick look in the data confirms it. So if, if we map the locations and look at the relative maturity, you can see the expected gradient uh, from north to south according to the relative maturity. So why we were a bit uh, disappointed with the genetic uh, analysis? So on the left side, you see uh, when you use relative maturity as a quantitative a trait and look for relationship in the data. So you look at all of the SNP data and I then, can you, can you uh, ask the data, can you tell me which genes or which SNPs are uh, related, correlated to relative maturity? You can get a very clear answer. You can get a distinct peaks. So there are four uh, loci that are uh, clearly uh, statistically uh, related to relative maturity. So that's promising as that's actually told us that the data is, is correct. Everything is good with the data. The problem was when you try to apply the same methodology to yield, you get just a bunch of noise on the, on the figure on the left. So you don't see any peaks that is uh, high, that raise above the noise. And this is also not that surprising uh, if you're a plant uh, geneticist because relative maturity is a very defined, uh, there, there are specific genes that are responsible for flowering time, for pod filling time, and probably these are the genes that uh, we are hitting similar to the diagram that uh, was mentioned uh, before. When it comes to yield, yield is a complex trait. There are many contributing factors, many, many genes involved, and this method likely will fail if you take yield. There are opportunities here to break yield into uh, its components and maybe identify uh, specific genes, but we didn't go down the, this route. We chose uh, eventually to ignore the, the genetic data in this uh, challenge. We supplement the data with uh, um, remote sensing data, which we found very powerful and very useful. And here is uh, NDVI, so uh, NASA can uh, look at the photosynthetic activity on the ground by uh, um, ratio of a, a measurement from their satellite program. And uh, here, just for illustration, you see that uh, the, the 58 locations are marked in black. And you can see in, over the season, one season, 2012, you can see how uh, the NDVI uh, scores are raising, so more photosynthetic activity, meaning more biomass, and hopefully more yields. We also use the land surface temperature to get an estimate of the temperature on the ground. This is also derived uh, from the NASA program. And the, the powerful uh, of using this, this uh, set is that we can extract time series uh, from different uh, sources. So we, here we have uh, NDVI uh, in black, and in blue, we have the uh, night temperature, and in red, the day temperature. And we can all correlate them to each other because they're all from the same site. Here is in one example. It's in one, one farm, one location in Illinois. And uh, you can see also differences in the way the data is. So NDVI, in this case, was uh, smoothed by NASA, very, very clean uh, data. In the temperature, we chose not to smooth them, so they're pretty much raw data. that You can see uh, a very noisy data, but still useful. And ju even just looking at the data on a cursory level, you can, if you uh, 
correlated to yields. So the, the yields in this particular farm in 2012 were lower than the average. You look at the NDVI and you see in the 2012, you see the uh, peaks that is lower than the average. So you say, okay, the plants are not uh, that healthy, they're not doing that well in this year. And you can even try to, to estimate what is the reason. If you look on top, you can see that the temperature in this uh, season are higher than the average, which uh, is, uh, makes a lot of sense. If the, uh, it's too hot, it's too, maybe too, even too dry, the plants are not doing that well and the yields are poor. And th this was only one example. We can also, uh, what we did eventually was uh, extract all kinds of features from the time series and identify features that correlate with yield. So on the diagram on the left, you see NDVI max, which is the, the, uh, the, NDV, the maximum values of NDVI are positively correlated with yields. And if you go down uh, the line, you see the temperatures, the sum of temperature in July and August are, ne are negatively correlated, which is, again, that's what we expect from the literature. Uh, so we, we can see good correlation. On the, on the right uh, side, you can see the soil variables, and they are uh, also uh, we, uh, the most uh, uh, identified feature is irrigation, which also makes a lot of sense. If there, is a lot, if, the, if there is irrigation, there is positive correlation with yields. Plants need uh, needs light, need the soil, need the water, most of all, uh, to grow. So that was not a surprise. Okay, so we have a set of uh, variables, so now how do we go on to, to uh, make a model out of it? So uh, based, on, uh, our, uh, based on the literature and based on uh, what is uh, happening now in, uh, in the big world of uh, developing models, uh, we, they're all, they're, uh, we are converging on models that are on, uh, at least in, the, in this area of data science, uh, models that are around it, decision trees, so which are versatile models that can handle many type of variables, uh, and they're doing pretty good in terms of prediction. So our in in initial uh, idea was look at random forests, but we acknowledge that random forests are not perfect, and sometimes uh, there are there are now newer uh, versions that are better suited. So we uh, initially we didn't do a, a comparative analysis like here, ex exhausting all of the options, but we aim to use random forest and then later on I'll show you that Kubist was actually superior. And just to illustrate, just a traditional linear regression model are doing poorly. Random forest right out of the box with very little optimization are getting better at the prediction, although you can see trailing effect. This is something that is noticeable in random forest models. Nice thing about random forest models is that it allows you to go back to your model and see the contribution of the variables uh, to your model. And as, uh, as expected, the NDVI, which is, again, it's, a, it's another look at the phenotype just from the sky, uh, are, are highly uh, contributing to the model. The, the temperature in August and, and July, again, are ever strong contributing. Irrigation is strong contributing, so nothing is surprising. It just uh, reconfirmed the, the ranking of the variables. The, the big disappointment was when we actually extended uh, the model from, uh, from the training stage uh, to the actual forecast, and then uh, it, it basically uh, crashed. So that's what you see here on the, on the bottom diagram. Trying to predict uh, 2014 for the class of 2013 didn't give us a very a good result, and we were quite disappointed and almost gave up. We, we looked at all kinds of options. Maybe something is wrong with the data, maybe the model, uh, try all kinds of permutation, try to throw in the genetic data, although we didn't believe it will help, but I said, okay, maybe adding 1,000 more uh, columns of the data will help, didn't help. Uh, so we, eventually what saved us was uh, the Kubis model, which was uh, developed by uh, Ross uh, Kunlin in uh, quite a, a number of years ago. And it's, it's a different take on decision trees. It's called the rule finding. It's, it's have a boosting mechanism of committees and neighbors. So it's, it's sort of a parallel universe and, and some data scientists uh, swear by it. The inspiration uh, for the name, I guess, comes from the, the Kubist uh, movement in art where uh, artists like Picasso identify in, in its innovation in art. They found another way to represent present figures by breaking them into cubes. This algorithm also breaks the, the, the sea of data into a segment of more linearity, which helps the, the, uh, build the model. It was fairly uh, easily implemented in R, and uh, we can uh, uh, model run ext extremely fast. I was surprised how fast it ran. Even, even if we added the genetic data to it, it, didn't, it was uh, running very fast. 
the, and we use the, the boosting mechanism. So we, in some tuning we did, uh, we found out that uh, we can use uh, 10 committees and five neighbors, and this is what we are eventually used in our, in our final models. The other, uh, I guess, interesting features that we have in our system, we decided that the relative maturity are different enough uh, from each other that we would rather actually fit a model for each individual uh, relative maturity band. So we just brought, we segmented the data to uh, the individual uh, uh, relative maturity and fitted a model uh, using Kubis for any for every uh, relative maturity band, and the, uh, one of the the so here are all of them are laid out in uh, in just a simple table that you can compare them to each other, and it's quite clear that some of them are, are good, some of them are bad, and this is judged uh, by the the RMSC value so and the and the error rate. So the, the ones that are good are good. The ones that are bad are highlighted here in red. And probably you can see quite uh, quickly that they are the ones that have less cases. So less than 200 cases doesn't end up in a good model. Again, it's not surprising. The, the more cases you have up to a point uh, give you a better model. And it's also actually operational conclusions that you can actually increase the, the accuracy of the model if you increase uh, crosses or uh, uh, locations if for the relative maturities that are uh, uh, missing here. Cases are missing. Uh, in, in terms of digging into the, also there is interesting lessons. If you dig into the contributing factors in each relative uh, maturity band, you, you can see patterns emerging. Uh, probably in the south, uh, there is more, uh, uh, the, the high temperature in August and July are more, uh, play far more roles than uh, soil, uh, for example. So there are uh, interesting uh, correlations and maybe even lessons for the uh, prescriptive uh, type of uh, works that in the future will be done because you can look at this, a plant, a plant geneticist might look at this and, and it uh, will give him a better insight in what crosses to make in the future. So to summarize, we, we, believe, we strongly believe that the machine learning methods are useful and can uh, enhance uh, yields overall in, in field, although agriculture is complicated as we heard, but, uh, and we're not talking about uh, jumps like the, the exponential jumps, we're talking about the 5% uh, uh, boosting in yield is, is uh, uh, certainly achievable by applying a, a simple, uh, relatively simple uh, techniques and with, with uh, relatively uh, um, low, num low numbers of data. Of course, the, the model is not perfect and it can be made more perfect by adding uh, more variables, for example, uh, and NDWI is a wetness indicator also produced from a remote sensing and, and we think will we'll have a big impact on uh, the quality of the model. Adding more variants and more locations, particularly in the in the uh, relative maturity bands that are missing, uh, 2.3, etc., we could help the model and make it more accurate. Ad adding uh, uh, the uh, data, as uh, was described, uh, so historic, more historical data. So the data starts uh, 2011. If you can have data from a uh, hundred years ago, you can probably uh, identify long long term uh, trends in the data which will make the models uh, more powerful and also uh, in in this case we we cheated a bit in the sense that we are not really predicting the future we are using uh, the, the the remote sensing data for the next season but it, it's quite obvious that uh, today with with time series analytic techniques you can expand uh, into the future. You can extrapolate the, the series into the future, especially as, as the season, in the future season, but also as the season goes on. So in the beginning of the season, you might be able uh, to make the prediction for the end of the season before you even harvest, uh, which would be useful. Uh, again, uh, similar techniques can be used on not only for seed selection, but also if they provide it to farmers, can help the farmers selecting uh, seed variants that are more uh, uh, more have a better fit for their particular farm and can boost their their yields uh, as well. So uh, provide again was a question before about how how can we uh, um, deliver uh, the good to the farmers as well. So it's not only uh, which seed uh, Syngenta will choose as their commercial value, but also providing some of these uh, tools to the farmers themselves will be beneficial for the farmers and for society in general. So that's uh, conclude my talk. If there, are, um, how much am I doing with time? You've got uh, ten more minutes. Ten, ten more minutes. Two questions. Or okay. Whatever you want to wrap up. But